Good morning. I'm Barbara Lohman of the Coastside Land Trust, the board president and chair of the Stewardship Committee. I want to invite you to celebrate our local open spaces with us today. We have a really exciting set of experiences for you. I want to take you back to 1997 when a group of local people got together to protect land on the mid coast. And at that time, they had less than 30 acres of protected bluff top. Today, there's more than 200 acres of protected land for, from the Coastside Land Trust throughout the urban midcoast. It's quite an achievement. We also have an office at um, 788 Main Street that in normal times is open for visitors and all kinds of inquiries. We're looking forward to that being open again next year when we get to more normal times. I'd like to introduce to you Joe Chamberlain, who has been our executive director for more than 13 years and is responsible for a lot of that increase in protected land. And I know that she has got some very interesting things to tell you about how land trusts work. So, Jo. Thank you, Barbara. So the acquisition of 422 fee title properties plus 20 conservation easements in the last 15, 20 years has been quite an accomplishment for the Coastside Land Trust. And we're delighted to be able to continue acquiring property and saving it in perpetuity for the public's benefit. So one of the interesting things about being a land trust is that we need to monitor the properties. And that includes our fee title properties, of which there are 422. Fee title means that you hold the grant deed on the property and you own it outright. Um, conservation easements, of which we have 20, is a restriction on someone else's property, either a municipality or a private individual. And uh, the restrictions are placed at, usually at the time of development. And we accept those conservation easements. And with that comes the responsibility to monitor it at least annually, monitor each property at least annually, and to um, write an extensive report, take photos from specific photo point locations. And this is true also for our fee title properties. Now, as I go through these other stewardship uh, responsibilities, it could not be possible to do this without the incredible volunteers, folks that help us all the time, every day of the year, people are helping us. And without the hundreds of volunteers that do this, we would not be as successful as we are and be able to provide these beautiful experiences for you. So some of the fun um, that happens when you have this many properties is we received our tax bills like we all do for our properties. And this year for fun, we weighed the, the tax bills and we have four and one half pounds of tax bills, which is pretty neat. <laughs> So the plant management, of course, we on our properties, we use a very light touch. We uh, remove invasive species and plant uh, native species. We pick up the trash, we clean our and repair our signs. We do graffiti busting and that's always fun. We uh, do our graffiti busting with mud. We throw mud on the graffiti. And then when the rains come, it washes the paint off when the mud washes off. We also maintain our trail to make sure that it's safe. And that's the one third mile of the bird trail. Now the benefits that we all enjoy from this open space includes our physical and mental health free for all to enjoy. All of our lands are open and free. Our protection of uh, rare, endangered, threatened, at risk animals You'll see some of those later in the program. And also uh, we have a habitat for all plants, all the plants that are growing and the animals and of course us. The um, so the following slides 
were all taken on Coastside Land Trust lands. The sl slide sequence will start at our southernmost property and it will go north over our properties along the primarily along the bluff tops here on our coast. We are grateful to Barbara Dye for putting the show together, the slideshow together for you. So if you happen to know Barbara or see her, please make sure you thank her. Enjoy.
I hope you enjoyed looking at all of our wonderful plants and animals in the slideshow. We have a couple of very interesting programs that we've been running uh, for a few years. And we're delighted to have as a staff member here, uh, a project manager who manages two things, the Junior Land Stewards Program and also the webinar series that we begin due to the um, uh, um, inability to have in-person activities at this time. And she's going to show you some slides and share experiences with you and, and how we uh, incorporate this into our everyday work on our protected lands. Kate? Thanks, Joe. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm excited to get to share with you the Junior Land Stewards program today. Um, and I'm going to begin by sharing with you a glimpse of what the program looks like in the classroom and in the field. Um, and then to pivot a bit to what it looks like currently this year with all of the restrictions of the pandemic and how we sort of transitioned into what we're doing this year. So our mission, uh, for those of you who are new to the Junior Land Stewards Program, our mission for this program is to connect the Coastside students with their local open spaces and to, to guide them into developing the skills and desire to want to become lifelong stewards of the open space. So from that, our program goals, um, number one is to develop real and meaningful connections to the local ecosystem. Um, and that means getting them out in the field. That means getting them to get down on the ground and explore and be a part of the ecosystem around them. And that those real meaningful connections only come when they're spending time. You can see this photo is perfect example, but it could be seen any moment that they're in the field. Kids really taking time to explore, to talk, to synthesize what they're learning in these small groups. And I'll get to sort of what those small groups look like. Um, the second goal being authentic stewardship, that what they're doing is something that is meaningful to them, meaningful to the environment around them, um, and that they're seeing that as, as truly an authentic stewardship project, uh, that their learning is experiential and promotes higher level thinking, and that with that higher level thinking that they're seeing themselves as solutionaries, that they're looking at, at problems that they're seeing or, um, or, or opportunities that they're seeing for them to take a step or to, to have thoughts and also to take steps to be a part of solutions to environmental problems. Um, and that it's multidisciplinary and well integrated. And I wrote NGSS for any of you teachers out there, um, that next generation science standards that we're working with the curriculum that already exists um, in the elementary school and helping to integrate and helping those teachers to weave this into the curriculum that's already there. And that includes their science curriculum, their writing curriculum, all those other pieces that they can use this to weave around and that it's cross age grade connection so that we're going to that you can see in this photo that students are working with um, some of the AP environmental students and I'll get into that in a minute. So in person program based on those goals um, that it's an integrated classroom curriculum that spans from October to April um, that there are four field studies projects um, and those are the are all with uh, with Hatch has been trips to Wavecrest open space that um, the students are working, this is pivotal part of the program, thank you to Barbara Lohman, um, the Half Moon Bay High School environmental science students are the field guides. Um, and this part of it, um, is critical. The high school students are arriving before each of the field projects, the field studies um, arriving beforehand and they're learning what they're gonna be doing as the guides for that day. And we actually do some classroom and out in the field um, training with them prior to their work with the students also. Um, and that they're directing the elementary school students in small groups and that they're doing all of the work. So this makes it so much more powerful because you'll see here the kids are working in small groups in this top picture you'll see they're they're mixing seed and soil to do some seed broadcasting below they're doing these ecosystem scavenger hunts and again small groups they're working with um not near peer because they're working with these high school students but they so appreciate these students and listen to them and are able to, to have these conversations about what they're seeing 
um, that we are doing pollinator plantings, um, that they're looking at what's already out there. And we're working with California State Parks um, Nursery and finding plants that are um, will bring pollinators to the Wavecrest open space. And that we end with a, a culminating visual art project and a community celebration. So I'm going to quickly just share with you what those field trips look like in these field studies projects. That first field trip that we're out is all about investigation and observation. And you can see here some kids working with some journals. We do not condone picking. I see that there's a little flower in this picture, but I had to put it, we had to put it in here because it really truly shows the energy of kids coming together and looking at what they're seeing, you know, looking at what's around them. And they had, at this point, they've already studied um, scientific journaling. So it's giving them an opportunity to, to put that to work, but also just to get out there and, and look around and feel and get down low to the ground and looking up high and noticing what they see. Some more pictures of that. You see Natalie on the left is working with the small group um, on a scavenger hunt, I think. And in the middle on the top, you'll see they're looking at a, a, a spider web actually. Um, and then some of the kids do part of the investigation. Um, that field trip is a solo writing opportunity for each student. So we'll see two students doing that. Field trip two is preparing the land for future planting. Um, and that's, you'll see in this, looking at what's there, it's studying some of those plants that are there, non-native plants. Um, and then here you'll see um, tarping, the plant, the area, getting tarping that area. There's the, all that hemlock, so that invasive hemlock and getting it ready to prepare for their gardens for their next um, field trip when they'll be pulling that off and getting out all the hemlock and planting their own plantings. Um, and then following that in the classroom, the kids do their classroom planting. And in this case, I think they're planting um, the phacelia and the um, lupin. That's what, the, what they're planting here. Um, and again, indigenous pollinator plants that they're planting in their classrooms. And I think this is a good time in the slideshow to share. Again, they're working on this classroom curriculum all through the, you know, from the October until May or April, May. Um, so they're working weekly doing um, scientific work, whether it's um, plant dissections or whether they're doing science journaling or soil explorations or um, looking at, you know, literature or fossil simulation, uh, fossil fuel simulation, all sorts of different things. Um, but these are a couple of examples. And then that third field trip is the kids are getting out there. They're bringing their seedlings out to Wavecrest. These particular ones were our first year and you can see they're very, very tiny, but they actually did quite well. Um, here they are planting. And then that fourth field trip, they're re returning a, a couple of months later and looking at what has grown. And they've put these signs in um, that you know, after that third trip, but um, look at this. I mean, these are all plants that have grown from the program. This was last year because of course that we ended up having to be at, staying at home. We did, um, it, they got just enough time to come out and see their, to view their plants, but we just did weekly updates for the kids, just sent them a couple pictures a week just so they could see what the things were growing. And these are some pictures that we took along the way and it was exciting to see them. This beautiful lupin and seaside daisy and key flower. Um, and then the phacelia here, this is absolutely gorgeous. I don't know if my, my video box might be covering it, but in the lupin. And then the end with the um, uh, a gallery event, that science and stewardship. And that I, the focus on that is um, why do we need these wild open spaces, right? Um, why are they important to the community? Why are they important to us? You can see here, the kids are doing some of the artwork for that. And this is what the event looked like two years ago. Of course, last year we did a, a virtual gallery because we went, um, it was scheduled for April. So that was after what we were all stay, staying at home. So, and then along came 2020. We all know the pivots that we all had to take, sort of giant etch-a-sketch as a friend of mine was saying, um, to it all, to all programs everywhere. Um, and so I'd just share with you a little bit challenges that I think all of us recognize at some level was in creating curriculum for students is how do we keep this relevant? How do we keep this connected? How do we keep this hands-on? How do we, still for us, how do we still foster that high school connection? Um, how do we keep it equal? So it's not just families that opt in, but the, but the, really, the idea here is focusing on people that wouldn't necessarily have that opportunity normally as well. Um, and then how do we keep this program growing? 
from that, we were able to also identify some really wonderful new opportunities. We had this virtual opportunity um, to give kids this exposure to a holistic greater study of the ecosystem. Um, and we had some great talks with local environmentalists and I, we aren't the only ones to say some of the best and the brightest local environmentalists in the field, people that are here saying, yeah, we'd love to help. And we would be very happy to you know, be a part of this. And we talked with Joseph Santoni um, and the high school students at, and about them being our virtual guides and, um, and the teachers at the schools. And, and we're given the opportunity to work with not just fourth graders at Hatch, but now fourth and fifth graders from Hatch, El Granada, Fairlawn View and Kings Mountain Elementary School. So we grew from about hundred students to 350 students in the virtual realm. Again, that will look different when we're back in the field, but. Um, and so here we'll give you a couple of glimpses. We don't have a lot of footage of what they're doing. The teachers are, are sharing a little bit of flip grids, but that's kind of harder to share on a slideshow. So I'll show you a couple of photos, screenshots. Um, this is a little girl with her ecosystem bottle. There are little moths inside there. It's getting quite proud. Um, the curriculum, bi-weekly videos, local environmentalists um, presenting, um, different topic areas, high school students start the videos, um, sharing about why um, environmental education is important to them. And then they also walk the students through the hands-on activities at the end of each video. And, um, and then also the curriculum is also supplemented with um, guided student reflection. So topic areas of this, this sort of comprehensive look uh, at our ecosystem, um, we have the study of plants and birds and mammals, the soil and geology, um, Fitzgerald Marine Reserve um, did a great video on intertidal zone, um, a presentation on the invertebrates, um, science journaling, and also just a greater overview of the ecosystems of the coast and um, our open spaces. Some of the hands-on activities, fun hands-on activities. We're getting to see some of the flip grids that the kids doing them, but a soil decomposition testing where they're burying two different types of, of cloth and or two similar cloths in two different soils and looking at, at um, the microorganisms there and the activity. Um, plant wanted posters, bottle ecosystems, as you saw, paper airplanes that were designed to fly like different birds, um, uh, bug pooters, which is a, a sort of a humane way to collect a bug to, to, um, to look at it ecosystem scavenger hunts, food chain activities, car game. And then here are some video, uh, again, screenshots of the videos of high school students teaching the kids. And this has been a highlight of this virtual program as well. Them walking the kids through the program. And um, these are a lot of their, you can see this little boy on the left, a high school, a an older boy um, in camouflage. He comes out all in camouflage. And then here are some photos of the kids working away. Again, you can see them um, explaining, I think, uh, just biotic. They're looking at biotic things. And this little boy, I just love this image of him with his little binoculars. And then, um, yeah, so in terms of next year, our hope, of course, is to get back out into the field. And our hope is also to be growing this program to um, growing it each year, a little bit by little bit. And our hope next year specifically is, is to be growing it to another elementary school. Um, in our, we have our site set and sort of com communication with El Granada Elementary School in our growth to that school as well. So if you're interested in this program, the virtual program, um, we would be we'd love it for you. If you, this is for, is a gift for the community and it's a gift for the students of Cabrillo, but it's also a gift for folks that are working at home um, or that are in the private school sector, any of that stuff um, that you are welcome to this. It is open and, and a gift for you. So to hop on our website um, or our YouTube channel, and you can just get into our, you know, the junior land strip section of our website and you can take a look at some of those videos. And I would recommend just watching them straight through. Um, but you can also pick and choose what works for you. Lastly, um, just a, a, a shout out to the people that are making this project really work. Um, it, as we know, it takes a huge village and I have never recognized that um, as much as I have in working here um, in this program, what a village it takes to raise these kids and put a program like this together and what a village we have in Half Moon Bay. Um, with tremendous gratitude to the Tomberg family philanthropies who, who started us off and got this as jump started to begin this program with a seed grant um, that has gotten us out and started and running 
and we couldn't be more grateful to them for that. And Cabrillo Education Foundation has also helped to support us for specific needs. They um, purchased the science journals for our first um, uh, our first year, and then they also um, have helped with um, uh, our speaker series this this year as well. Funding of that. And then this is just a picture of some of the people. I, hopefully some of you who are watching this are either those people or know these people. If you do know these people, I, I mean, as I was putting this collage together, I thought, gosh, even this is reflective of the personality of a lot of these folks from the teachers, Robin Arkell, Joseph and Tony at the high school who absolutely said yes to every single thing along the way. Um, yes, how do we make this work? Yes, absolutely. Um, and Pam Manesti, a new teacher at Hatch, who's just nailing it with the kids. Kids. And Brian Feltz, also another teacher, um, to the to um, the people that are working at the Coastside Land Trust, the board, the staff, um, certainly Joe Chamberlain and the and the board and the um, stewardship committee, and and also to the environmentalists and people in the community, right? The people that have jumped on board, like Tony Corelli, like Alvaro Jaramillo, Jamir Laz, I mean, all of these people who are saying, "Yeah, I'd love to help you. How do I help?" Um, in this program and have become part of our speaker series. And Susan Boyer, can't say enough, if those of you who know her, what a gift she is to this community and to our program. So we ask, this is of course, um, hopefully when you see this or if you've seen us out and about in the field, you can recognize what an important program this is. And we are at a point where funding is really necessary to be, make this a sustainable program. And so, um, we ask you to really please consider donating. I know there's lots of different organizations and things to be a part of, but where we are and the juncture we're in right now, I think the opportunity to donate has a lasting, would have a lasting impact on getting this program, um, kind of we're, we're getting it into that place that it's sustainable for the next generation that will continue with this program for years and years. And, um, and that's our hope for COSIDE and for our kiddos here. So um, I want to share with you also, um, and this is just a couple of slides, but I do want to just let some of you know, if you don't know about this, probably a few of you do know about this, our virtual community webinar series. We've been, um, since the beginning of the pandemic, so back in March, we this, we've decided upon a webinar series, a community webinar series, which is free and open to the public and um, a tremendous gift, again, to, to everybody who's in the community. And we've had a really high turnout of people that have come to see these. Um, our first one was with Alvaro Jaramillo, which draws a humongous crowd of people because he's fantastic. Um, he's gotten my family really interested in birds, my, my parents, both of which really didn't know a whole lot. And they live in Maine across the country, but they're just fascinating. And these are, these are all on our website. So please, if you haven't seen any of these and you're going, oh gosh, I missed that. Well, we have a whole, you can go to the past webinar section and see all of these. Uh, Wildflowers and Plant Communities with Tony Corelli, top notch um, marine mammal series with Dan Costa we just finished up with um, on there as well and um, Janet Leonard who's on our um, stewardship committee um, who did a presentation on banana slugs which is really cool <laughs> Um, and then looking forward, uh, Monarchs, we're going to be doing a presentation with a representative from Xerces. We'll be um, doing a presentation in, in January. Um, we'll be doing a virtual tour of the Año Nuevo um, elephant seals in February, which, yeah, looking forward to that. And then in March, we'll be doing track and scats so or a scat so um, those are a few that you have to look forward to there's actually a couple other that are kind of in the work so keep your ears to the ground and we'll certainly send you some e-blasts e but look forward to those too yeah and that ends where i what i have to share so i'm going to turn this back over to joe and thank you all for joining us today Thank you for joining us today and uh, looking at our properties and our successes and our plans for the future. And we're really hopeful that you get an opportunity to get out on our lands and enjoy them and that you consider the, the work that we're doing valuable enough that you'll continue or begin to provide us with financial support so that we can continue all of this wonderful work. Best to you. Bye-bye now.